She has been worshiping Satan, and this is her sacrifice to the devil. Story after story after story like that could be told tonight if we only had time to tell it. The scripture has a great deal to say about the devil and demons. In fact, the whole Bible is the story of a conflict between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. And the scripture I would like for you to turn to is Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, two verses, the 10th and 11th verses of Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard. You remember the story of Saul. He broke that law of God. He had lost contact with God. God had left him. No more blessing upon Saul, the great king of Israel. And so he decided that he was going to consult a medium and try to get a message from Samuel. He consulted the medium. He was successful in talking briefly with Samuel. But he was killed shortly thereafter as the judgment of God fell upon Saul and his family. Now, Americans at this hour are vacillating, according to the latest polls. Some deny the existence of the devil altogether. But others have an unnatural fascination with the devil and with demons and with exorcism and other things in the occult. And because of the success of The Exorcist and many new films are being made on the subject of the devil and evil right now, a pastor who saw one of these films said recently, it was obnoxious, repulsive, disgusting, pornographic, and obscene. I myself have not seen any of these films. I do not intend to expose myself to this type of thing. But a Jesuit priest who saw one. But a Jesuit priest who saw one of these films said in his survey among university students, most students that have seen the films wish they'd never seen them. Now, this is not a phenomenon just in America. It's also in Germany, where there are thousands of witches. It's also in Great Britain. A British bishop said the other day that Great Britain is turning to black magic as their interest in Christianity declines. And I believe that one of the problems in the world today that is not recognized is the great intensification and acceleration of evil in the world at this moment because the devil knows his time is short. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may be drawing near. And the scripture teaches that as the coming of the Lord draws near, the activity of the devil will intensify. The kidnapping, the violence, the terror, all over the world, I believe is a part of demonic activity. One authority says that witchcraft is growing faster than any other religion in the Western world. And one reason I think that young people get involved is because it does get them involved. It's a return to nature in a sense, a worship of the natural gods, finding some power within themselves or broadening their minds, some of them through drugs and some without drugs. But thousands of young and old alike are dabbling in their cult at this moment. Shops in our cities are selling all types of things that go along with their cult. One university professor, not this university, but a university professor said some time ago that there were dozens of covens on their campus. Now, a coven, as you know, is a circle of witches and warlocks, and warlocks are male witches, numbering 13. They're always number 13. And they have their rites and their rituals and their literature and their witchcraft. Now, what is right and what is wrong? What is false and what is true? The Bible has a lot to say about it, and I'm going to cover a big subject in a very few minutes tonight. First, the Bible teaches there is a devil. There is a devil. We meet him in the third chapter of Genesis, 
and we don't get rid of him till the end of the book of Revelation. He's all the way through the Bible. And in the Bible, we find that he's a person. He walks, he talks, he tempts, he lies, he flatters, he kills, he works miracles, he counterfeits, he oppresses, he afflicts, he influences, he destroys, he quotes and misquotes scripture, he possesses, he inflicts bodily injury, he sows discord in the church, he spreads false doctrine. Those are the things that this personality in the Bible called the devil does according to the scripture. Now he's called in the Bible, he's called Satan, he's called the devil, he's called a fallen angel, he's called a roaring lion, he's called the prince of demons, he's called a wolf, a prowler, Beelzebub, the dragon, the serpent, Lucifer, a great light, a star, a betrayer, an adversary, a wonder worker, a liar, the father of lies, the god of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince of it and power of the air. His is described in the Bible as the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of unrighteousness, the kingdom of hatred, sin, death, hell, and the grave. He produces false miracles, false spiritual experiences, false tongues, the father of fakery. He has a false church, a false gospel, a false plan of salvation, a false trinity, false preachers, false prophets. That's what the Bible says about the devil. Now the word Lucifer means light bearer one who shines it's a deceptive light it's not the true light it's a deceptive light it's a false light he promises freedom liberty and life but he produces only sorrow slavery and death he's a deceiver and he's trying to deceive thousands of you young people tonight by promising you that if you only follow him and serve him and bow down to him and live for him, that he will give you freedom, liberty, and life. But actually, he gives you sorrow, slavery, and ultimately eternal death and hell. Now, the devil is resisted in the Bible by the characters of the Bible that God honored and blessed and loved. He was resisted by Job. He was resisted by Jesus. He was resisted by the disciples. He was cast out of heaven. And the Bible says he will eventually and ultimately be cast into hell, the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you say, how did the devil originate? Why, why did God allow the devil? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. The Apostle Paul calls evil the mystery of iniquity. There are just some things we don't know. God did not reveal it to us. And if God did not reveal it to us, we shouldn't be delving into speculation. But there are some hints in the Bible about where the devil originated. In Isaiah, the 14th chapter, and Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. In the 14th of Isaiah, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground? For thou hast said in thy heart, and then it says five times, I will, putting his will against God's will. Listen to it. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, there came a time somewhere back in eternity when Lucifer, the highest and greatest of all of God's created beings, led a rebellion against God. And it seems that about a third of the angels joined him in the rebellion. They were cast out of heaven 
they landed on this earth and the devil and these fallen angels who have now become demons are active on this planet they're under judgment they've been defeated by the cross and the resurrection they are ultimately going to be cast into hell but in the meantime they are active and increasing their activity now the sin of lucifer was pride he wanted to be like god he wanted to be above god he wanted to be the greatest being in all the universe so he led the rebellion you say where did he get this idea we don't know how did sin enter his heart we don't know why did god allow him we don't know this is wrapped up in the mystery of god it's wrapped up in the mystery of iniquity it's something we don't understand and it'll never be resolved until the battle of armageddon when our lord jesus christ is going to come back followed by thousands of the armies of heaven and he's going to destroy forever the devil and his angels and we'll be rid on this planet of the greatest plague and the greatest thing that has ever happened to any planet anywhere in the universe now the second thing what about demons the new testament makes one thing clear there's one devil there are many demons you remember the story in the fifth chapter of mark the man of the gatherings this man was possessed of a devil many demons and it had affected his mental his emotional and his physical faculties and he and jesus held conversation not with the man but with the demons jesus never talked to the man at all he talked to the demons and there are several things about that man that interest me today and are relevant at this hour in america he was naked he was a streaker he was violent he was violent and look at the violence in the country and he wanted he wanted the demons to be cast or the demons wanted to be cast into the swine into the pigs you see the combination you have here you have violence nakedness self-destruction and pigs what do some of the people call the police today some of the more violent people pigs is there a connection i don't know but it's quite interesting that this demon possessed man that jesus encountered would have all of those things that we're wrestling with today now the origin of demons as i said a moment ago is unclear jesus said i beheld satan as lightning fall from heaven and the bible says in revelation 12 the devil and his angels fight against michael the archangel and his angels now you say what about exorcism well do you know what the word exorcism actually means the word exorcism means expelling spirits by a religious act or religious service that's how what it means expelling an evil spirit and Jesus, of course, was the greatest of all exorcists. He commanded the demons and the forces of evil to come out of people. And that man that I was telling about a moment ago, he commanded this legion of demons to leave. And they left and went into the swine. And the swine went hurtling into the sea and destroyed themselves. Now, the fact of exorcism is a reality but it's misunderstood some of the modern interpretations originated actually in pagan practices magic formulas and rituals to expel evil spirits have been practiced for centuries in primitive societies usually accompanied by violence and infliction of pain there's one tribe in india that i read about where they take a cotton wick soaked in oil and they light it and they stuff it up the nostrils of the person who is supposed to be possessed of demons. And the cruelty of professional exorcists in many parts of the world 
is beyond our comprehension and understanding. Now, Matthew, the eighth chapter, tells us that when the disciples brought to Jesus many that were demon-possessed, he cast out the spirits, not with a long ritual, as we're being told today, but by a word, his word. And his disciples cast out demons, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by a word. The power of the name of Christ. And Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall accompany those who have believed in my name. They shall cast out demons. However, there's a warning. Don't go around using some sort of hocus pocus and say, Be gone in the name of Jesus. It won't work. You have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you have to be walking in the Spirit and you have to know that that's a demon and you have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have the authority of God's Word back of you. Behind the name of Jesus stands the power of Almighty God. Now, how do you keep from being possessed or harassed and vexed by demons? You see, demons have power only, that is, as far as a Christian is concerned, only when you are walking in some sin. If you allow a besetting, besetting sin to get a grip on you, you've opened the way for the demons in your life. As we walk with Christ, if you're a Christian and you're walking in the Spirit and God is with you and all known sin has been confessed and you're in fellowship with Christ, then you can walk in the middle of the most dangerous spiritual situations and be protected by God. You can claim authority over the devil and his angels. But I'll tell you what the devil will do. He'll bluff as far as he can. He'll take all the ground that you give him. Give him an inch, he'll take a foot. A woman possessed of the spirit of divination, you remember, bothered Paul in Philippi. And he said, you evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of this woman and leave her alone. And the evil spirit came out. Now, I personally have had that experience a few times, but very few. And I was trying to think only once in America. I remember twice in India. I remember once in Africa and once in the Far East, twice in the Far East. And on each occasion, very interestingly, the person involved used the same three words. I am free. Christ can free you. But it's not done with a ritual. It's not done with the way we're, it's being depicted. It's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every believer, every Christian, has the right to pray that prayer with a person who is in trouble. Now, a great many things that we call demon possession are not demon possession at all. For example, mental problems are not caused by demons. Some may be, but many are not. And so you have to have discernment that only the Holy Spirit can give you as to what is demon activity and what is normal activity or the activity of nature. You say, well, how do we overcome demons when they bother us and harass us? I want you to listen to this. First of all, be sure you know Christ. I do not believe that a true believer in Jesus Christ can be possessed by a demon. You can be vexed by a demon. You can be harassed by a demon. But I do not believe the scripture teaches you can be possessed by a demon. Now, Satan filled Judas. Satan filled Ananias and Sapphira who were professing believers. We're told in Scripture. But are you sure that you know Christ? Do you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? Have you settled it?
come to Christ tonight while you can. As Bill Cepeda said he did five years ago. As Mike said he did three years ago. Come to Christ. Surrender your life to him and make sure about that. And you will have a power living in you that is greater than he that is in the world. You will have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in your life. And you can resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. The second thing, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you tonight as a believer, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? You can be filled, not through some emotional ecstasy. You can be filled by a simple act of faith. How did you receive Christ? You received him simply by faith. All right, you're filled the same way. You can say, I am filled by the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit by faith. You see, the moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. And as you surrender everything that he points out that's wrong in your life, then he fills you. And you're filled and you produce fruit. Now, every Christian has the gifts of the Spirit. You have a gift. I don't care who you are and how lowly a Christian you are, you have a gift. And you ought to be utilizing that gift in the body of Christ, and you ought to be utilizing that gift in witnessing for Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is something different. The fruit of the Spirit is different than the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. That's produced by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are living in the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, Satan cannot get inside of you at all. But let me tell you, sin, even the slightest little sin, will grieve the Holy Spirit and open the way for demonic activity. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor desert you. I will not forsake you. Now, the third thing, watch for the schemes of the devil. The scripture says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the devil is going to exploit your personality quirks, the lust of the flesh, the natural physical drives that you have, hunger, as he did Jesus. He tempted Jesus when Jesus was hungry. The devil always comes to you when you're weak to tempt you, to harass you, to trouble you. Watch out for those moments when you're weak, when you're hungry. He also uses the sex drive Sex is a powerful drive that we all have, and the devil will use it if we give him a half an inch. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, that ye may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then the Bible outlines the armor that we should have. And I want to ask you tonight if you have your armor on. Have you checked it? First, check it. The belt. Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. Now, the belt or the, gir or the girdle was a belt about six or seven inches wide that went around a Roman soldier. And by the way, when Paul was writing this in Ephesians, he was in a Roman jail and a Roman guard was guarding him. So he just looked at his uniform and got his illustrations for how we Christians ought to be. And one was that belt because you see that belt or that girdle held everything else in place. And Paul says, have your loins girt with truth. In other words, Learn the scriptures. Learn the word of God. That's the reason when people come forward to receive the Christ, we give them a Bible study and we get them involved in the scriptures, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures. This is how we resist the devil. When Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, what did he do? Argue with the devil? No. He resisted the devil by quoting scripture. That's all he did, just quote scripture. He said, it is written. 
And when he was finished quoting the scripture, the devil would leave him. And angels would come and minister to him. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. So you need a righteousness that has been provided for you. And it was provided for you by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness. So that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says... How about your boots? Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now that doesn't mean to go out and just preach the gospel. It means more than that. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart. So that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. You see, Satan uses worry, anxiety, and tension to keep us off balance are you afraid do not fear for i'm with you says god do not anxiously look about you for i am your god i will strengthen you surely i will uphold you with my right hand says god in isaiah 41. are you worried about inflation everybody is bills are stacking up pressures of business closing in children getting out of hand are those are the things you're worried about the scripture says be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god and the peace of god which passes all comprehension will guard will guard your hearts and minds in christ jesus and then fourthly what about the shield the roman soldiers carried a shield the scripture says in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one now roman's shield was two feet wide and four feet long and it warded off the blows of the enemy he would hide behind it when Rome, when arrows would come against him satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us we need the shield of faith trusting believing in god taking god at his word and then fifthly there's the helmet and take the helmet of salvation the helmet is very important because it guards the brain protected the head there's a lot in the scripture to say about the mind let this mind be in you which was in christ jesus that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee intellectually you cannot come to christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil but when you come to christ your mind is illuminated by the holy spirit and the things that you didn't understand before you now accept by faith and you put on the helmet and that helmet protects you against the enemy the devil is going to try to cause you to doubt he's going to try to cause you to question i remember my own father he had been told by a preacher many years ago that he'd committed the unpardonable sin and my father thought all those years that he couldn't come to Christ. He hadn't committed it. He didn't even know what it was. And it was years later that he found the joy of his salvation again. You see, Satan had sidetracked and perverted the scriptures. And then there's the sword, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. You see, our Roman's blade was about 24 inches long, and he would twist and turn, keep his balance always, thrusting. And the Scripture says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to study the Bible, to know the Bible, to learn the Bible. And I believe this. I believe that Christians and believers are going to go through a period of trouble and difficulty. We may go to jail. We may be killed for our faith, as many people in other parts of the world have been. 
We're not going to escape. It's on the way. And the way to get prepared is to learn this book so that when they do call upon you to witness, when they do call upon you, you know the scriptures. And you can quote the word of God and be a witness and resist the devil. And the scripture says he will flee. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Praying and Bible study. Check your armor. Is it in place? One final word. The final victory. The devil and his works and death and hell and the grave have been nullified. They've been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. The victory is won. The victory is assured. Till that final day, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of fighting, a lot of battling, but we're on the winning side. And the scripture teaches that Jesus Christ has won the victory. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. There is power in the blood. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of Matthew. The 12th chapter of Matthew. And beginning at verse 38, somebody asked me what version I'm using. I'm using the same one Paul used, the King James Version. You know, we have so many versions today that you can stand up and quote Scripture, and if you misquote it, they think you're using another version. <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting. I have, I guess, well, I guess my wife and I must have 25 different versions. Well, I'm going to the King James Version as I normally do in my preaching. I like a, a number of the versions, and they throw a lot of light on it. And I heard the story that someone told about uh, the Apostle Paul had received, oh, pardon me, Timothy had received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And behind him were two donkeys loaded down with baggage, and they said, what is all that? They said, well, these are the commentaries to tell you what Paul is saying in that letter. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see you do a sign. We want a sign. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Isn't it strange that Jesus would use Jonah? He didn't tell us not to believe the story of Jonah. He accepted the fact that Jonah had been swallowed by a whale or a ship or a big fish. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was using that as an illustration of his own death and resurrection. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Remember when Jonah preached to Nineveh? And Nineveh was a great city of several hundred thousand people, and the greatest revival of all time took place when that entire city turned to God in repentance. They repented of their sins, and everyone in the whole city turned to God. And God spared that city the judgment. And I've been praying for America. Oh, God, spare America because we see the possibilities of our world being destroyed, not only in atomic war, but also by AIDS and other things that are gripping our world at the moment. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But behold, a greater than Solomon is here. How could a greater than Solomon ever come? I want to talk about that tonight. I want to use Solomon's life as an illustration of the lives of Americans today and American young people. Because you see, Solomon was a man of great knowledge. 
And we look on every hand today and we see young people seeking knowledge, security, love. It seems that they are on a great quest. Young people seek to define themselves in terms of clothes they wear. And we hear that the miniskirt is on the way back and the crowd they run with, and the things they buy, and the places they go, and the rock concerts they attend. But many of our young people today are lonely. And I was talking to the dean of one of our great Eastern universities, and I said, what is the greatest problem on this campus? He said, lack of purpose and meaning. That was Dr. Bach at Harvard University. Now, the results of, jo of Solomon's search were expressed time after time. He said, vanity of vanities, life is nothing but a vanity. And the word vanity means a bubble that burst. He sought pleasure by every conceivable means, but it was nothing but a bursting bubble. Solomon had it all. And at the end, he said, it's not worth it. First, Solomon attained great knowledge. He knew more than any man that ever lived except Jesus Christ. He said, I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me and all of those that are going to follow me in Ecclesiastes 1.16. In 1 Kings 4.30, it says, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. He said, I gave my heart to know wisdom and I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit for in much wisdom and knowledge there is much grief. He said, you can know it all. Have all the knowledge and have all the PhDs and all the rest, but it doesn't satisfy something deep inside our hearts and our souls. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the struggle intensifies around the globe right now for the hearts and minds of youth. But Christ said we're to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And you cannot come to God alone through your mind. Our natural minds have been affected by sins. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 14, their minds were blinded. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. The God of this world is the devil. The Bible teaches there is a devil. There are demons. And they have the power to blind your mind towards spiritual things. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding, says Paul in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Now, that's the New International Version, by the way, that particular scripture I just quoted. Now, the Bible teaches in Titus 1 that our minds are defiled. In Daniel 5, it says they're filled with pride. In 1 Timothy 6, 5, it says they're corrupt. In Ephesians 4, it says they're filled with vanity. In Proverbs 21, it says they're wicked. With all of our stockpiles of knowledge, do you know what we've learned? We've learned something that Adam and Eve did not know in the Garden of Eden. We've learned the knowledge of evil. Adam and Eve gained the knowledge of evil when they sinned against God. God never meant that we were to know what evil was. He created us perfect human beings we were to live thousands of years on this planet. We were to build a wonderful world with God's help. But we rebelled against God and we gained the knowledge of evil. And now we've reached the point in civilization where with all of our knowledge, we have now invented the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb and chemical weapons and computers and all the rest that make it so that man can be wiped out in a matter of hours. What can we do? Receive Christ. Let him dominate your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The scripture says you can be transformed in your thinking. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give your mind to Christ. Yes, there's going to be peace because Christ is the Prince of Peace. He's going to bring peace. But only through God are we going to find peace. You can have peace in your heart right now. You can have peace of mind right now by surrendering your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. 
The Bible says God made the wisdom of this world look foolish. The world failed to find him by its wisdom, and he chose to save those who have faith in the folly of the gospel. Notice he calls the gospel folly. The gospel is folly to this world that has its mind blinded and affected by the devil. You see, sin is a disease. It's also a disease of the mind. It's worse than Alzheimer's disease or any other disease that you can think of. It's destructive, and we all have it. The Bible says all have sinned. What can we do about it? Come to the cross. Let Christ forgive your sins, change your life, turn you in a new direction, and give you a new mind because Christ can become the Lord of your mind as well as your body and as well as your soul. And then Solomon was not only the smartest man and the most brilliant man that ever lived and the best educated, but he gave himself to great pleasures. In Ecclesiastes 2, 1, he said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with laughter, therefore I'm going to enjoy pleasure. He had every sensual pleasure that you can imagine. The Bible describes in details all that he had. He had the finest swimming pool you've ever read about. It was flanked by 12 lions of gleaming bronze. He drank the finest wines in golden goblets. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Talk about sex. He had it. More than any of you will ever have. And every pleasure that you could think of was at his beck and call. He did what many of you would like to do, but you can't afford it. Some people are good because they can't afford to be bad. But God doesn't count that. Some sin is expensive. With every imaginable device of pleasure and lust at his fingertips, Solomon sat out under the stars one night and contemplated the emptiness of it all. He said, vanity of vanities, it's all vanity. It's a bubble that burst. How many of you are crying tonight on the inside? On the outside, you have a mask. Inside, the peace and the joy and the happiness that you've always searched for is missing. Something's wrong in your marriage. Something's wrong in your courtship. Something's wrong in your school. Something's wrong in your life. Something's wrong between you and your parents. Something's wrong between you and your friends. Something's just missing in your life. Do you know Christ? Do you have the joy and the peace that he can bring? Because in him are the pleasures that you can have. And then Solomon was the richest man in the history of the world. His income was staggering. It's all listed in the Bible. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. That's billions of dollars. Did you know he had a stable of 40,000 horses? But one night he sat on the top of his house in Lebanon. And with indigestion, his hand clutched at his empty heart, and he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's all a bubble that burst. It's nothing. All this pleasure, all these riches and everything are nothing. The Bible says in Psalm 37, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I'd rather be as poor as Job's turkey and know Christ than to be the richest man in the whole world without Christ. In Proverbs 23, he wrote, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away like an eagle. Jesus said, Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And we look on Wall Street. Sometimes they show those pictures of those men going crazy. Just, I don't know how they keep up with it all. But people go crazy over money. And even poor people long for money. They say, if only I had a few thousand dollars, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't, because you want a few thousand more. And then Solomon had great power, men like power and prestige. 
and no nation of the world of that day dared defy Solomon. He had more power than any man of his generation. He had the greatest army, had the greatest navy in the world of that day. And he looked upon his mighty military power and he said, it's all a bubble that burst. What shall it profit a man, Jesus said, if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Suppose he had all the knowledge and all the wealth and all the power in the whole world today and lost your soul. And many of you are doing just that. You've gained in your circle of world. You've gained all that you can gain, but your soul you're not sure about. You go to church. You have a name on a church roll. You've been baptized and all of that. But deep in your heart, something is missing. You don't know what it is. The thing that's missing is that personal relationship with Christ. But Paul talked about another power that comes. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And then so Solomon turned to the aesthetic like He said, well, maybe I can do some other things that'll bring happiness and peace and joy to my life. He said, I made pools of water. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments. He got orchestras and he got ballet. He got everything. And whatsoever my eyes desired, he said, I kept not from them. I had everything I could ever think about or desire but he said it was all vanity. He developed a love for art and music and culture. He built beautiful gardens, had musical recitals. Then he said, I looked upon all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, it was all vanity and vexation of spirit, and there's no spirit under the sun, no prophet under the sun. You see, if you had it all that you're striving after, it wouldn't bring the peace and the happiness you're looking for. Why? Because it's found in Christ. The Scripture says, Behold, they're greater than Solomon's here. Now, Solomon also tried religion. He vowed to build the greatest temple that the world had ever seen. Solomon's temple took seven years to build, and it was called one of the seven wonders of the world. His temple was an architectural wonder. It was made ready at a quarry so that when it was built, they didn't use any hammers or axes or any tools of iron was heard while it was being put together. It was so perfect. He overlaid the temple with pure gold. The floor was made of gold. It took 150,000 laborers working seven years to build it. But religion without a personal encounter with Christ will not save the soul. It won't bring peace to your soul that your soul longs for. Where is peace? Where is fulfillment? Where is life's purpose and meaning? Finally, Solomon came to this conclusion. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, he said, there's a judgment coming. And to be prepared for that judgment is the most important thing in the whole world. Come to the cross. That's the only place you can find forgiveness. And Jesus said, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said what we see on that sign, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the embodiment of all truth. Think of a man standing in front of the world and saying, I am the embodiment of all truth. He's either crazy or he's lying or he's what he claims to be. Jesus said, I am the truth. And I can set you free, free from your anxieties, free from your troubles and problems. I can give you a peace to go through them. Now, he doesn't take your troubles and problems away, as Don told us a few moments ago, but he gives you a peace and a joy that will enable you to go through them and live through them if you put your trust and your faith in him. Yes, Jesus was greater in wisdom. It says, in whom I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's in Christ in Colossians 2. In Jesus Christ. If you know Christ, you know more 
than the professor at the greatest university because that professor is looking for something that you've found. Christ was greater in giving pleasure because the Scripture says in Hebrews 12, who for the joy that was set before him. You see, when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live into your life and he produces in you joy. It's supernatural joy. And there's pleasure beyond anything that you ever dreamed in Jesus Christ. I remember the, my mother was dying a few years ago up here in Charlotte. And the last words my mother was heard to say was in a loud voice at 5 o'clock in the morning. She'd been in a coma. She hadn't said a word. She hadn't moved. And she was a great woman of God. But she suddenly sat up in bed the day she died and shouted out, Psalm 149, 5, Let the saints be joyful in glory and let them sing upon their beds. Can you imagine that? I think she was already in heaven. In 1 Peter 1, it says, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though ye now see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there pleasures forevermore, the Bible says. Psalm 1611. Do you know that? Do you know that kind of joy? That's something that's supernaturally produced. You can't find it anywhere else. You can't find it in sex experience. You can't find it in drugs. You see, the whole country is on a quest for something. In drugs, in sex, in entertainment, we, we want something. We don't quite know what it is. And it's elusive. We haven't, we don't find it. Oh, you can go out and have a good time at a party and prom is going to be around the corner. You can have a great time on your prom night if you get the right guy. But something will be missing. All of a sudden, in the midst of a crowd, in the midst of a dance, in the midst of the orchestra playing, in the midst of the band playing, your face will suddenly have a little cloud over it, just for an instant. It's just a moment in which it seems that it's not all put together. The puzzle is not put together. And then you forget it and you go on. But it's there, and it'll grow through the years. He was also greater in riches, it says, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. There's no riches compared to the riches in Jesus Christ. Come to Christ and he gives you the real things of life. And then he was greater in power. It says all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. And the Bible says that someday he's going to come back in power and great glory and his holy angels with him. No wonder the apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Do you know that power? Has that power come into your heart? Have you received him? I'm going to ask you tonight to make sure of your relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask you to enter into his force and march under his banner, under his flag, and say from this moment on, I'm following Christ, like Dawn said a few moments ago. Do you know him? Are you sure of it? I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want to come to Christ with all my heart. I want to surrender to him. I want to make sure. You want to receive him into your heart or you want to rededicate your life to him? You get up and come and stand here. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. Then give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You say, well, why do you ask people publicly? Well, the reason I ask people publicly is because every person that Jesus ever called, he called publicly. He hung on the cross publicly. He said, if you will not acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. The Scripture also says, he that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You may never again in your whole life have a moment like this tonight. What a gorgeous evening.
There may never be another moment when you're so close to the kingdom as you are tonight. And the Bible warns time after time, now is the accepted time, today is the day of salvation. You have no promise of tomorrow. You have no promise that your heart will be feeling the way it feels tonight. God is speaking to you. You're making a choice tonight. You're making a choice between Christ and all that the world has to offer. And you're saying, Lord, I'm putting you first from this moment on. I want to get in your, on your side. You get up and number on the screen. There are people standing by to talk to you. And as hundreds are making their commitments to Christ here at the williams Bryce Stadium in Columbia, South Carolina, you can make your decision for Christ right now. Mr. Graham has already encouraged you to make that telephone call. We hope that you will. Special friends are standing by, ready to talk to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you.